but unusual. So if you think about seven of those hours are being spent on things that you shouldn't be doing next year, that in itself as a pursuit of like, how am I going to actually achieve that and get rid of these things is incredible for your growth. You don't have to worry as much about like, oh, I need to hit these numbers or these revenue numbers or hire this much this team. But if you have to figure out how to not do a lot of the things that you're doing, everything else will follow. Welcome to the Push Podcast. Why push? Because a nudge is just too friendly. And friend, we're here to help you get your shit together. I'm Eddie. And I'm Janelle. And we're the Copelands. We've got three daughters, two businesses, a mortgage, and lots of responsibilities. So just like you, we're struggling to find that perfect balance of ambitious go-getter hustle while still staying present, loving our kids, and working on our relationship. <laughs> and doing the laundry, going to the grocery store. Oh, and don't forget being mindful. You yeah, know, all of the stuff. <laughs> <laughs> so if you're juggling all the things, but you're also trying to get to the next level, guess what? You're in the right place. So get ready to be pushed. Hey guys, welcome back to the Push Podcast. I'm Janelle. And I'm Eddie. And we're here today with um, someone I'm really excited to bring you uh, into the conversation with. So let me kind of frame it a little bit. In 2017, uh, we had started our online business where we were coaching and consulting bakery owners. We knew nothing. We were reading all the books, uh, watching all the courses, going to all the conferences. Staying up all night. And throwing ourselves out of bed because we were really excited. Absolutely. And that only lasts for so long. I don't think that anybody, even Superman, even if you have the most amazing passion, uh, you can go sleep deprived. You can go lacking focus. You can just be really excited about hitting the grind every single day after what? would you say six months or so? Yeah. So I went to this conference in 2017 and I met this man and he was talking about this thing called overwhelmology. <laughs> and I was like, whoever he is, he's my savior. <laughs> and I don't know if you remember, but I ran up to the stage afterwards and I was like, I need help. And I was like in this complete state of panic and desperation And so I immediately hired him as a coach. We immediately started working together. I bought his book. I was like super stalker status. And um, so I'm excited to introduce you guys to one of our former coaches, Ari Mizell, the overwhelmologist. He is an author, a podcaster, a father, and he believes in the art of doing less. So welcome, Ari. And I don't know if anyone calls you this, but Mr. Automation. Yeah. Thank you so much. Thanks for having me. So you're coming to us live from New York, and it's a little cold. You're under the weather. The weather's confusing, but you're here, and I want to thank you for that. Well, I I mean, it's always a pleasure to talk to you guys, so I'm happy to be able to do it. And uh, I do have a little bit of cold, so people are going to have to bear with my uh, sort of nasal voice today. Awesome. So Ari, here's why I wanted you here. Uh, You helped us a tremendous amount with automation and outsourcing and delegating And we're working with so many people, just even regular people that have jobs that nine to fives, you're juggling being a parent, being a spouse. And people, I just think, are so overwhelmed now. I think this is your specialty. So have you noticed that nowadays it's just like this increasing problem? Yeah, absolutely. More so than ever. And part of that is that there's just so much more access to stuff, right? And uh, no matter where you go, you can it's a great convenience in some ways, right? That we can run our businesses from our phones. But what that means is that the thing that's always in our pockets is like our business and is calling our names and all. It's like the Jumanji <laughs> box. It's you know, like drawing people in with the drums. Um, so yeah, it's a big problem. At the same time, I think that you have, I wouldn't necessarily call it a movement, but I think that you have a lot of uh, fathers and who are getting much more involved in parenting, um, myself included. I meant to that. Uh, and, Thank you. Yeah, yeah. and it becomes harder and harder to balance those things and, and really integrate those things. So there just is this constant desire to do everything. Yep. And it makes it so that nobody ends up focusing on anything. Yeah. So I Googled really quick, like how to deal with overwhelm. And it said a bunch of things that to me, like told you to do a bunch of other shit. Yeah. Like it was like, take deep breaths, take some extra time. Do some meditation. More, more coping mechanisms instead of actually Like reducing. how do you fix it, right? But yeah. then I thought, well, if I were overwhelmed when I was, the last thing I fucking had time to do was sit there and like take time to myself. And so can you kind of walk us through some tips and frameworks and things that you do to coach your students? 
Yeah, so the, the very first thing really comes down to tracking and awareness, honestly, because the, it, it sounds very circular, but a lot of the times the things that cause overwhelm are we don't know what's causing them because we're overwhelmed. So mm. it's like that idea of being underwater, right? You can't read the label from inside the jar. Mm. So it, it's a lot, it's really hard to know what's causing the problem when you don't stop and look. Mm. And a lot of us, uh, human beings in general, sort of, we can tolerate a lot of pain, you know? So we get into this mode where it's like, I'll just work harder. I'll just shovel faster. Yeah. And somehow like I'll get to the top, but it just never works that way. And it's a lot harder for someone to be like, no, you have to stop what you're doing and actually try to figure out what's happening. And you get that image of like the, I love Lucy where she's in the chocolate factory, you know, mm. and all the chocolate. Like, so if you stop, you feel like everything's just going to you know, run over you. Basically you're going to get hit by a bulldozer, but you have to, it's the only way to do it. And you have to look at how you're actually spending your time, your resources, your money, your, your space, everything, and be a little bit introspective about it. Uh, so that, that's really the first thing, because once we know what's happening, then we can start to attack the problem. But most of the time people don't know what the problem is. And I think this is a good segue, though, because you've done a TED Talk and you've talked extensively about like what your why was, your driving force behind why you got into dealing with overwhelm and outsourcing and things. And that was because in 2007, you got diagnosed with Crohn's disease, right? Right. Yeah, exactly. Can you talk so, to people a little bit about that? Because from what I understand, you were in construction, you're smoking, drinking, living the life, and then boom, it hits <laughs> you, right? Living the hard life. Uh, so <laughs> I was 20 years old when I started working in construction. I did this big development project in upstate New York. And yeah, I was living a very unhealthy lifestyle. And when I was 23, I got diagnosed with Crohn's disease. And uh, Crohn's is a chronic inflammatory condition that affects the digestive tract. It's considered to be incurable. But the long and the short of it is I went from working 18-hour days to struggling to do an hour of work in a given day. And that extreme restriction on my time has really been the basis for everything that I've created and written about since, which is that innovation really comes from those restrictions. And if you ask somebody, what would you do if you had to work an hour less a day? They usually would just tell you they'd skip lunch. But if you ask that same person, what would you do if you could only work an hour a day? They get stumped, right? It's a completely different way of thinking. Because at that point, the question really isn't what would you do? It's what wouldn't you do? And if the things that you wouldn't do still need to get done, then who or what is going to do them for you? Mm, what wouldn't you do? Yeah. That's really powerful. Yeah. And, and it was mixed, what's powerful about that is that you innovated around your limitations. And so we, we deal with people so often that when they get limitations and they get restrictions, they just they fold up and they do nothing. You right. made it a crusade. <laughs> well, it was really great because you said extreme restriction creates innovation. Yeah. And I think that's like women when we have babies, it's like, okay, well, the whole house is going to fall apart and my business is going to fall apart if I don't figure out how to outsource and delegate this stuff, right? And you're just taking it to a whole nother level. Like sometimes it requires extreme restriction for people to kind of get their shit together, right? Well, that's, the funny thing is, is I, I feel like as much as people think that they don't have enough time, they're too busy and all these things, the truth is, is that entrepreneurs have more available resources than they ever have any other time in history, right? So we really do have more time, more access to money, more tools and technology that will help you do. So we really have these things, but yet we feel like we don't. Uh, and the example that I always like to give is, it's, it's a funny one, but it's a really good sort of illustrator of it. If you think about MacGyver, for example, right? Remember MacGyver, mm -hmm. right? Yep. Yeah. Yep. <laughs> well, uh, the, uh, nobody ever said to MacGyver, like, hey, there's a Home Depot across the street. Pick up shopping cart, get whatever you need, and go blow up that <laughs> building. Right? It was always like, here's a paper clip and a box of Bisquick. Go, yeah. go blow up the building. Right? And so if we don't have those restrictions, then we don't need to come up with those innovations. So I think that even if you don't have you know, a life-threatening illness, like, you really need to examine your ability to work under constraints. Uh, question yourself and see what would it be like if you used half the money to do your next project or your next event or your next software development? And what would it be like if you only had half the time to finish a proposal? We have to try these things because we know from a lot of neuroscience that work expands to fill the time allowed to complete it. Yep. And you can get usually the same work. Actually, you know, in your business, there, there's all sorts of uh, TV shows where people have to make these incredible, cre you know, creations <laughs> in an hour, right? Yeah. So it can be done. Yeah. It's like the, the high school kid cramming at the last minute. They get oh, more studying done in, in, you know, 12 hours than they did in actually two weeks. <laughs> right. Exactly. 
So okay, so I got that you need to examine all of the stuff that's on your plate. You need to ask yourself, like, maybe what can I not do, right? Not Instead of like, right. what, what would I do? What would I not do? And then you need to kind of question yourself around, you know, the importance of those things maybe. And what if you're like the students we deal with who are like, well, everything's important. I'm in the beginning stages of running a business. And I'll tell you, because you just shook your head. People can't see, but I love it. Because you were the coach that basically said, stop what you're doing and examine everything. And I was like, I don't think this guy gets it, right? (laughs) And then I had another coach that said, Janelle, you need to slow down to speed up. And I thought for sure both of you were from another planet and didn't understand what I was going through. You didn't understand my current workflow. And I know now that that's ridiculous. So how do you shake some sense into people that are like, this guy just must not understand. My life is different. I'm a mom. I'm doing all the things. What do you say to those people? Yeah. So sometimes, (laughs) you know, sometimes people have like the come to Jesus moment on their own and something happens where they're like, okay, there's got to be a different way. But a lot of it is really trying to get people to see what the future looks like with the way that they're doing things now. That seems to work a lot better generally because it's one thing to try to show somebody there's another way. It's another way to show somebody that the way that they're doing it now, which they already know is not good, is just going to get worse. Mm. Uh, and there's just there's just no question about it. And then you ask somebody in that situation, like, what happens if you get sick? You know, what happens if you get hit by a bus tomorrow? The, the hit by a bus, uh, yeah, you know, thing that everybody always uses. Like, what happens to the business? And most people at that point are like, well, the business would shut down. Yeah. Yeah. So that's a problem. So we need to fix that before that actually happens. Mm. And you don't stop with just your business. I mean, I've heard you uh, like <laughs> optimize and, and <laughs> your health, your health, the your babysitter, kids, your kids getting medicine. Like, how does that play a part? Like, do, you know, when you talk about helping people with you know efficiencies and autom- automation for their business, you actually go further and it's in your personal life as well. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. I mean, so we we actually don't have a babysitter. Uh, we, <laughs> I, yeah, it's been a struggle at times, but we don't. You uh, had one though when we were coaching with you. I remember you had some light switch or something that you were because you had told oh, yeah, us. No, no, that was a, yeah, yeah. You that, said, and I got to tell the people this. You said if there's a task that you do that's recurring and you do it more than once or twice, you've got to put a system in place. And it was some freaking light switch, you guys. That <laughs> like if he hit this light switch, it automatically PayPal'd the babysitter forty that's bucks, right, yeah. and I was like. Like, you've got to be joking me, right? <laughs> so at least talk about it. Maybe we fired the babysitter, but at some point we paid her with the light switch, right? <laughs> yeah, yeah, that was a funny one. So there's a, like a Wemo light switch. And if you if you held it for more than two seconds, then it would kick off, uh, I think it was Square Cash, actually, and it would pay the babysitter. Right. So it made it so my wife could just pay the babysitter that way. Of course, we never told the babysitter about that because it was <laughs> Self-defeating, uh, but that was uh, that. Was, yeah, so there, there's things like that. I mean, I've literally done like route optimization to get my kids to school because my kids go to two different schools. So I've there are <laughs> this is very geeky, but there are <laughs> there are tools that like Uber Eats would use or like any delivery service would use to do multiple stops to find the ultimate like optimal route. So I have done that to get my kids to school in the most optimal way because Google is actually wrong about it. <laughs> <laughs> um, and then anything that's like household supplies and stuff, that's all automated delivery, like medicines, as you said, uh, household supplies. We have three cats and a dog. I don't remember the last time we went and bought dog food or cat food. You know, So these are all these sorts of things that uh, people will keep themselves busy with and they'll tell themselves that it's really important that I do this stuff myself because somehow you're the best possible person at shopping for vegetables right but it's funny but it's really it's like a lie that we tell ourselves and the techniques that you apply to make your business more efficient you should absolutely be applying to make your life more efficient not so that you don't have to do the things but so that you can do the things that you want to do i take my kids to school every morning and i pick them up from school every day that is very much an outsourceable thing that i could be doing but because i don't have to then come home and deal with paying bills and deal with the shopping list and deal with home repairs and things like that. None of that stuff is on my list. That means that I can focus on the things that really matter and what I want to. Yeah. yeah. Did you feel like when you first started doing that, that you you gave yourself all this time? Like, did you immediately know what to do with it? Because I know that there's people listening right now that are like, okay. What if I didn't have to do If I didn't have to do those dinner. things, they probably don't even know what they would do with their time. So they end up wasting that time. Like, when did that shift for you or did that automatically 
you know, you knew what to do with it? No, it's a really good question. So there's there's sort of like a seesawing effect there. So like there is good if you're really overwhelmed, then there's going to be amount of time. There's going to be a period of time where you free up an hour, you use up that hour like that. If you free up another hour, you use up that hour. But at some point, honestly, like at the point where I'm at now, like if I free up an hour, there's going to be some sort of leisure activity that I'm probably going to fill with it. Like I'll start reading more <laughs> or exercising. I'll use that stuff for really like personal growth and development because there isn't a whole list of stuff that I'm supposed to be doing more for the business. So you do reach this point of sort of critical mass where it becomes harder to fill that time with business stuff. But uh, for the for the most part, I would say that the average, on average, when we work with people, they end up saving about 10 hours a week. And for people who are truly overwhelmed, usually have no problem filling that time. Wow. Yeah, for sure. I mean, the thought of like, oh, I'm going to free up five extra hours a week just to watch some of the courses that I've purchased or, you know, yeah. take a walk and listen to an audio book, something like that. It's really exciting. And I know I'm always in constant practice of kind of managing the hours and stuff. So that's thanks to you. Yeah. And one of the, the concepts that you brought to our attention that I think that we are trying to find a way to implement is that thinking about offloading 70% of what you do today today, and thinking about that next year, you know, that not being on your plate. And so the folks that are overwhelmed and thinking about the fact that how even the stuff that you're overwhelmed with right now, how would you offload? That was a concept that we were like, I think we were stuck on that for a Quite some time. That was probably worth the many thousands of dollars <laughs> that we paid you for. You just t- saying that one thing. And for the listeners, again, it was, and I'll let you articulate, but what I got was what you're doing today, 70% of what you're doing today, you should not be doing next year as a business owner, right? Yeah. Yeah. I mean, it's it's like it's like uh, molting a snake's skin, like, right? You know, like you need to like offload the stuff in order to take on more stuff. It's just very simple. But that number is based on a research study. Uh, and I forgot the basis of it, but it's proved to be really, really helpful that we look at, uh, you know, seven out of the, a lot of entrepreneurs are working 10 hour days. That's not unusual. So if you think about seven of those hours are being spent on things that you shouldn't be doing next year, that in itself as a pursuit of like, how, how am I going to actually achieve that and get rid of these things is incredible for your growth. You don't have to worry as much about like, oh, I need to hit these numbers or these revenue numbers or hire this much this team. But if you have to figure out how to not do a lot of the things that you're doing, everything else will follow. Mm. Do you find that people mostly get stuck on the fact that they can't even think that far? Like they don't even know what they would replace it with? Yeah. And again, a lot of that comes back to tracking. But part of it is also an ego issue, mm. honestly, is that like people think that there's just there's a thing that only they can do. And some of them, they're, they are a little bit more justified in thinking that. But for the most part, I would tell you that the majority of the things that you do, I do, any of us do in a given day are things that could be done by other people or other things as well or better and probably faster. Yeah. Uh, and that's a hard pill for people to swallow. It is. But I learned uh, from you, like being a better mother, like didn't mean... My kids don't really appreciate when I fold their socks, when I'm, yeah. you know, doing their laundry. I learned that from you. And so it was life-changing for me. I hired you as a business coach, but for me I was like, you know what? They don't care if I cook the food, if I go to the grocery store. So we started ordering delivery yeah. service for our groceries. I hired a housekeeper because I was like, if I have my kids don't care if I scrub their toilets, right? So I have someone come in and do that who also folds the laundry and it freed up up at least six hours a week for me to be able to do other things, that could just mean now I get to take you on a bike ride. Now I get to spend quality time with you and I don't feel so overwhelmed. So I do agree. Like that's why I wanted you on here. There are so many things that even if you don't have a business, you got to look at like, what is your barometer for that, Ari? Like for me, it was if my kids don't really care if it's me, mommy, that does that, then I got to outsource that. Yeah, so the, the the way that I look at it is like I, I basically am at a place at this point where I never have to make a choice about what I want to do with my, my personal time, mm-hmm. right? So if I'm with my family, I never have to be like, well, I could do this with the kids or I could do the dishes, right? So like those choices don't ever come up at this point ever. 
Uh, and when they did, that was a chance to examine it and think about how we could do things differently. Uh, and and you're, you're spot on with what you're talking about. They don't care if you fold socks and things like that. Uh, I've had the, my virtual assistants fill out camp registration forms for my four kids, which is a lot. And I'm not a better father by filling out those forms <laughs> myself, right? It's like, it doesn't show more love. Right. It right. just makes you resentful. It just makes you resentful that you're spending time doing those things, which makes you a worse parent. <laughs> <laughs> it's true. And I remember we were on a coaching call one time and you were the PTA president of one of your kids' schools or something, taking a call, <laughs> walking down the streets of New York, you know, to the PTA meeting. And so I want people to know that you do all this normal stuff and you've got four kids and a business and lots of clients. Um, what are some like maybe household things that you and your wife had decided to outsource that might be kind of crazy to some other people? Because I'm sure you meet people that are like, wait, you do what? Well, it's actually not so much. We don't, I don't think we outsource anything particularly crazy. Uh, you know, we do the usual like food and, and supple, or, um, staple delivery and things like that. But it's more about what we automate in the house, I think. So a lot of, well, deliveries, that, that also counts as some automation. But there's a couple other light switches in the house. <laughs> Two things that will help save time. Um, a lot of like uh, mail delivery. That's another one. So we could get mail here where we use this. We use a service called uh, Virtual Post Mail, I think it's called. But it basically is a, an offsite mail service. So all of our mail goes there and it gets digitally scanned and we can have it open remotely. So what that means is I can actually have a virtual assistant deal with physical mail. Um, which is a really nice thing. And if there's a bill that comes in, then that can get paid without me having to even really know about it within certain parameters. So a lot of that stuff is, yeah, even things like that uh, is taken care of. Whenever whenever we order something from Amazon or whatever, and I actually have something sitting on my desk right now, uh, and we want to return something, I literally, I just send a voice message to one of the VAs and I say, we ordered this pair of shoes, like do the return label. They will do the return process, which two minutes, but they'll do it. And then they'll send the label remotely to my printer. So I just have to walk up and take the label and put it on the box. So there are things that might save 30 seconds, but it's also the kind of things where it's like, oh, I got to go do that thing. Like I'm going to go sit at your computer and just mess up your flow. Mm. Yeah. And I, and I want everyone to know this because, you know, I know we want to be respectful of Ari's time, but like you mentioned in one of your talks, like this is really tough. In, in the U.S. and thinking about offloading and thinking about doing less because they typically will, will, will use that time to work more. I and, think he's right. It's an ego thing. We yeah. want to control all the things. Yeah. Yeah. A lot of it is about control. Uh, totally. And it's also about guilt to some extent, right? Mm-hmm. Like we feel like if we have this time, then we should be using it for more, more, more and more. And there's never an opportunity to think like more is you can always be better at what you're doing. That's something that I'll, I'll, I'll say, like you never ever stop trying to be better at what you do. But most people reverse that. And it's like, I just need to make more money and have more things and all that kind of stuff. And the truth is, is that if you focus on being better in every way, and in, in our case, and many of your listeners as a business person and as a parent and as a husband or wife, uh, everything else that you could possibly want, in my opinion, will come out of that. Mm, that's awesome. Well, thank you so much, Ari. I definitely recommend that people get um, the book that I have, which is The Art of Less Doing by Ari Mysel. You've written tons of books, though. I counted seven. How many do you have? I think it's nine, actually, at this point. (laughs) Okay. So tell people how they can find you, follow you. Where should they connect with you? So everything uh, is at lessdoing.com. I'm on social media as at Ari Mysel for most things uh, on Instagram and Twitter and all that stuff. And uh, if they go to less.do slash foundations, then there's this free video course that we created on there that people can get as well, which is really helpful in terms of communication, project management, and processes to get them off on the right foot. Awesome. Well, thank you so much for your time. I hope you get better. I'm sure you've got some medicine in route right now on delivery. (laughs) Yeah. (laughs) IV doctor coming. How funny. All right, Ari, we'll talk to you later. Thanks so much. Thank you. Thanks, guys. Bye.
So that was great. Ari is obviously efficient. Even that interview was very, very efficient. <laughs> yeah. So we're at 25 minutes and that's the least amount of time we've ever done a, a <laughs> podcast in with a guest and with tactics. And so I want to encourage you guys to definitely do the exercise that Ari was talking about. Sitting down and really just evaluating what you're doing in a day was life-changing for us. Uh, when we worked with Ari, it was literally like write down everything. And I, what I noticed about how I was working through my day, there was literally no extra second available for anything else. That's what I thought. Right. But then I realized like every time my phone notification went off, I would look at it. Mm -hmm. Or if I got a phone call, I would take it. Or I was getting distracted by the email notifications. And so since then, I've turned off all of my notifications. You literally cannot get a hold of me unless you call and I have your name stored in my phone. Right, right. right? Absolutely. And the kids text me all day long and they're like, you didn't text me back. Yeah, because I have this thing called work. I'm not <laughs> sitting here just waiting for you to text me all damn day. Right. And um, I've mentioned in other podcasts before, like people always say, you never return my text. I'm like, I always return your text, just not when it's convenient for you. Right. And so I want to challenge you guys to start respecting your time and having a reverence for the time that you do have, because I feel like we've talked about death a lot lately, but yeah. Ari is absolutely right. If you have this laundry list of overwhelming to do's every single day, and all of a sudden you woke up and you were diagnosed with Crohn's disease like Ari, what the heck would you do? Yeah. And I think that if you take his philosophy and you start and like he has dedicated his life to finding innovations around like how to save time and like the things he talks about, you, you would think like who even thought of that? But that's something he the switch has been turned in his head where he's mm -hmm. like, OK, I've done this a thousand times. This is not something that requires me to do. And if I had this time back, I, it sounds like he's very planful what he would be doing with that time. And it's not more work. It's actually doing more time, more he, leisurely, more activities. leisure things, more things that I think will make him feel fulfilled and live a full life. Right. And back to, you know, getting some sort of disease or being hit by a bus or whatever sort of emergency could definitely throw a wrench in your plan. I would just tell you, those things are never convenient, right. but they're particularly uh, inconvenient for people who run themselves rampant, right? Yeah. And so if you feel like already you're spiraling out of control and you're on the verge of overwhelm and you have this laundry list of things to do, I want you to think about what he said. He said, if an emergency came up, it's not about what would you do, it's what wouldn't you do. Mm -hmm. What would you not have to do? Right. And he said a lot of people's businesses and lives fold. And so I want to leave you with that thought today. If you're feeling overwhelmed, can you spend the next three days kind of tracking and monitoring everything you decide to sign up for with your time? That's everything from hitting snooze three times in the morning, which I've definitely been guilty of. There's 30 minutes right there. Or rolling over and starting your day off scrolling through emails or social media. And then now you've become reactive to everything instead of planful, right? Mm -hmm. So now other things, exterior forces are controlling your time and your day, and it doesn't feel good. Right. Absolutely not. So so I hope you guys understand, like, wh what we're saying here is not so much about, like, hey, I just want to, you know, free up time so I can do more stuff. The, the idea is to do less. Right. The idea is to find time to exercise, to find time to meditate. And, you know, when you talk to people, and we talk to people all the time about not having enough time, well, you just talked to someone right now, or you just heard from someone right now, Ari Mazel, who has found ways to get that time back and do something very, very productive and meaningful with it. Right. And so in the height of his Crohn's disease, there was maybe one hour during the day where he felt OK enough to do any sort of work. Right. And this is what kind of started his whole life's mission to help people do less work in less time. And so, you know, I agree with what he says around we live in a time where there's more available resources than ever in history. Right. And I feel like we need to be smarter when it comes to uh, what we're saying yes to, what we're signing up for. I'll tell you, I don't, it's very rare that I fold laundry anymore mm -hmm. after working with Ari. And this was over two years ago. Right, right. Um, it's very rare that I'm going to clean the bathroom anymore because it's just not something that's a really good 
way for me to spend my time with all of the things I'm trying to do to grow and get better. Absolutely. So think about what things you can maybe offload. Think about what things um, you can outsource. And then some people are like, well, I don't have money for a housekeeper. Well, guess what? You probably have a friend or a mother-in-law or someone Uh, Think about meal prepping. Everybody is like always like, oh, meal prepping. What if you meal prepped with a couple of girlfriends and it wasn't your week this week and someone else was giving you food? I don't know. Get creative. But if your back was against the wall, I bet you'd be able to figure out a way to get your family fed, get the laundry done, (laughs) keep your business alive and uh, figure out how to just survive. Yeah. And if you can't find uh, automation and and you're not as (laughs) innovative, innovative, excuse me as Ari, then it's just sometimes about looking at the time that you're spending and what time you're wasting. I can't tell you how often I get in conversations with people and you end up start breaking down their time throughout the day because they say they don't have time to work out. And I find that, wow, you've got 10 hours to find some type of time to work out, or you've got you know five hours to find time to meditate or do all the things or, or write the book that you wanted to write or whatever the case may be. Uh, maybe it's just tracking, like he said, and finding the time that you're wasting. Mm. And when you find the time that you're wasting, what will you do with that time or what wouldn't you do anymore? And how would you change, how that changed the life that you're living currently right now? And I think we're just so quick to fill it. Yep. You know, if I'm not doing this, then what will I be doing? So lots of great things to think about. I hope you guys enjoyed this episode. This was designed to help you push through being overwhelmed and just feeling like your laundry list never ends. This is hopefully a wake up call for you to also say, well, what am I doing today that next year I should be doing 70% less stuff, right? Right. And we can I just say this? We didn't get into that. But to me, that is like a sign of leadership. Like when you think about like a, being a leader in your family, you think about being a leader in your business, whatever it may be, like being able to offload things so you can think about bigger things, that you can think about expansion or, or doing something that leaves a legacy, like that is growth, right? And because we, you know, talk about progress is a, about the ability to abandon things that, that used to work for you. Like that is a huge concept. And I think that, you know, we can get into that into another podcast, but I think that that was something I really took as not only for, you know, effectiveness of, in your business and saying, hey, I need to expand or need to be able to do less. I need to offload these things, but also a sign of growth. Well, the 70% less thing definitely rocked my world because you figure I had already been in business for like seven years. And I knew intuitively that I needed to do a lot less of what I was doing. Like when I first opened, I didn't have a towel service. I didn't have an apron service. I would take the dirty towels home and I would wash them several times a week. I would go to Costco and get the inventory and go, you know, run all the errands twice a week. And then I was like, why am I doing this? (laughs) This is dumb. Right. And then I started to hire uh, delivery services or companies that offered delivery. And yes, it cost more. But it also freed up my time. Yep. Um, and so there were a lot of things when I first started the bakery that I realized I can't do this. This is really stupid. It's not the best use of my time. So I want to challenge you guys, regardless of what business you're in, if you're a hairstylist, if you're a photographer, you know, there are photographers that have entire businesses and they outsource their editing. Mm-hmm. Just you send it to a company, you upload everything and they batch edit everything for you. So I want you to really just not think like, oh, this doesn't apply to me. It does apply to you. What are you doing today that does not require you to be doing it? Yeah, absolutely. Costco delivers people. (laughs) So have a great day, you guys. Thanks for tuning in and push through. Absolutely. Thank you for listening to the Push Podcast. Hey, we want to hear from you. So if you have a question or there's a particular topic that you want us to tackle and you want us to help you push through, you got to do something for us. You got to go to Apple Podcasts and you got to leave a rating and a review. And in that review, go ahead and leave that question with your Instagram handle so that we can shout you out when we actually answer the question. And we'll talk about that on the podcast and make sure that, hey, this particular podcast is made for you. So leave a rating, leave a review, leave your handle. And until next time, push through.